Okay, so thank you for sticking along. I think it's the intersection of the Bayesian and the visual that we saw in the morning, so now it's very few people that are left. I'm Mickey Widne, and I'll be talking about inferring functional connectivity in a full ensemble of regional ganglion cells sharing common inputs. This is work that I've been working on for the last few years with my PhD advisor, Liam Paninsky, uh, at Columbia. And it's a collaboration with uh, a lot of people, most of them used to or are at Erosa Mancelli's lab at NYU or at E.J. Chichulinski's lab at the Salk Institute in California. And uh, the beginning few slides of this I've showed you in last year's Gatsby meeting. Uh, we've made a lot of headway, and I hope that you'll enjoy it, and I apologize if you have any repeats here. And furthermore, um, some of the machinery that I'll, that I'll be using, both Philip just introduced and David this morning introduced, so I think this should be pretty easy going, and I don't think I will need the entire 40 minutes. So if you have any questions, please like interrupt, and let's make it interactive. So the general problem that many times in neuroscience we're, we're trying to answer is, is as follows. We have some kind of stimulus going into a system which we have either full observation of or full control of, even better. And then we have observations from our cells. And what we're trying to do on one level is just understand this input-output function. If we're just able to build a dictionary that will tell us for every stimulus what would be the response, what would be the output of the system, we're quite happy with that, or we can look at it from the other direction, we can say for every response of the neural system, what was the stimulus. And that's already a system identification problem, and, and that's a hard problem. But we're interested in one step further many times in neuroscience. What we want to know is what are the underlying mechanism, what is the neural structure, the, the neural network architecture that subserves this this computation. What is the connectivity between the cells that we're looking at which enables this input-output function? And we have many, many ways to analyze that in statistics and many times we look at the correlation in our outputs and out of that we infer some kind of connectivity and between our cells. And the problem is that latent common inputs alter our inference of the connectivity. So what am I saying? In any kind of recording that we're going to do in, the, in neuroscience, we'll always have neurons that we're not recording from. Those neurons might project onto the neurons which we are recording from. They might induce some kind of correlation in the responses of the neurons from which we are recording. And we might infer that as the connectivity between those neurons, where in fact it's only due to the common input that they're sharing. And we believe that that's a major problem that needs to be solved. Now, we believe that with the, advent, with the advent of multi-electrode recordings, we must tackle this problem. And what you cannot see here are many, many black dots on a light green screen. Right, so you have a dot, basically, every so often. And those are the electrodes in a multi-electrode array. Uh, very, very similar to, to the setup uh, which we used to record we, at EJ's lab uh, all of the data. And what you can see is one ganglion cell that is uh, injected with dye. So I hope that by the end of the, this talk, I'll be able to convince you that first is that we have a more biological model. I hope that we incorporated more of the biology into our model or as far as, as we're able to in terms of the biology than has been, uh, been done previously in this kind of framework. And second is that we have a more tractable model. Now that may seem as a technical point, but we believe that well, multi-electrode arrays has been one of the major advancements in neuroscience in the last few years, and we believe that this kind of uh, very large recordings, a lot of data, a lot of data is just going to continue this trend. And unless we, we really build statistical tools that are able to, to go through, to chug along this kind of like a lot of data, we're just going to be left with terabytes of data on the shelves, but not a lot of insight into the biology. Right. 
So the primary retina is an excellent preparation for attacking the common input problem. Uh, so we will both build our tools around the. That's an email for Evan. <laughs> we will build our tools around it, and uh, we'll try to, to understand something about the retina itself. So the retina is a feed-forward structure. We have the photoreceptors here. Light hits the photoreceptors, gets transduced into an electrical signal. That electrical signal gets picked up by the bipolar cells, by the horizontal cells, by the amicron cells, it's an entire zoo of cells in the inner layers, which will play a, a crucial role here. And then that gets passed on to the ganglion cells that are on the outermost layer. Because they're on the outer, outermost layer, we have simultaneous extracellular recordings of a complete network of parasol retinal ganglion cells from the Chichelinsky lab. So here we, we, we stick the multi electrode array and we're able to record from almost 300 cells simultaneously. Together with that we have paired intracellular recordings uh, of the parasol retinal ganglion cells which measure the synaptic inputs into the ganglion cells. That's thanks to Fred Rickey at Washington University. And lastly, significant synchronized firing has been observed between pairs of nearby parasol cells many, many places. Many people uh, here as well have reported that. So this is kind of like you can see the mirroring, mirroring between the general setup that I was trying to show you. It's kind of like we have a correlation between the outputs that we're observing. We want to infer what is the input, but there's also all of this common input from which we're not recording. So we have perfect, perfect uh, access to the stimulus. We have very good access to the ganglion cells, but we don't know exactly what's going on between. And those kind of cells might be sending inputs to different ganglion cells. Any questions? Good. So in 2008, Pillow et al. introduced or used the general, linear mo general linearized model uh, to capture the, to simulate a subset of our, of our data of 27 cells. And I will start with that and later on we'll expand it to our entire data set. But what they did is, in its most basic form, this is, this is exactly what David was showing us this morning. What we have is a stimulus X, which gets filtered by, by a stimulus filter K. That passes through an exponential nonlinearity, which gives us the conditional intensity function, which then out of that, we generate Poisson spiking uh, according to that. What they, yeah. yeah. Stimulus is, is space time? Yes, the stimulus is, is checkerboard stimulus. Special end time? Special end time, yes. Now, what they did is they introduced a post spike filter, H, which accounts for the dependencies of the cell's future spiking on its current spiking. And then, because of this synchrony that I told you that has been observed in ganglion cells, between ganglion cells, they introduced the cross-coupling filters, LIJs. So there is a filter between every cell J into every cell I, which account for the dependency of neuron number 2, for example, in its future spiking on the current spiking of cell number 1. Kind of transmits the information to the future. Any? Ki is a, is a convolution in, in, in time, but, but K has a special extent. So that would be the receptive field, and the receptive field has a special uh, place in the receptive field, in the visual scene, but it also has a, a temporal extent to it. Right, so this is a great model, first of all, because it's a tractable uh, model feeding problem. They chose everything smartly enough that they know that they have global optima. So once we fit everything, we know we've, we've reached the global optima. Not only that, but if we see it from the opposite direction, then this is an optimal Bayesian decoding problem. So we can look at it from the other direction and see what we get. And furthermore, not only is it easy to fit, it actually works. So it captures the response statistics, and they showed that in their paper. But it has two problems. One is that because cells are correlated at zero lag, so they tend to fire together 
immediately, even if we look at a very high resolution, they had to introduce almost instantaneous coupling filters. So there was almost no delay here, which doesn't sound biologically reasonable. And second, there was no room, there was no explicit room for the common input, which we already suspect that exists because we know about this entire inner layer of the retina. At the same year, Fred Ricci and uh, Cocktron published a paper in which they, re they reported two major findings. The first is that retinal ganglion cells receive strongly correlated synaptic input in the absence of modulated light stimuli. So what they did was they patch clamped two, two ganglion cells and they present to it only a gray screen, so there's no stimulus here. And they look at the submembrane potential as, as it evolves in time. And what they notice is that there is a cross-correlation in the sub-membrane potential. So those two cells are receiving correlated input, even though there is no stimulus driving them. And they, they reported exactly the, the time constant of this, uh, of this function, and they attributed this kind of, uh, this common noise is what they termed it, to be noise in the photoreceptors that probably gets uh, propagated through the bipolars. Their second major finding was that on retinal ganglion cells are weakly electrically coupled, and that there is no electrical coupling between the off retinal ganglion cells. So again, here you can see, you can see the, the two problems that I mentioned about the pillow model earlier. You can see them here coming up again in, in the experimental findings. One is that we see that there is some kind of a common input into the system that is independent of the stimulus that goes into the cells. And the second is that we cannot really rely on this direct coupling between them. Now, okay. So this is uh, what we did last year that I presented to you, and I will go over it quickly. What we did was to introduce a noise source. So here now we model our, our noise as an autoregressive, an AR process with an autocorrelation function that agrees with the one that Fred Ricci reported in his findings. And, and that passes through a mixing matrix. Here we only, back then last year, we only looked at pairs of cells that look, uh, gets mixed up uh, by the mixing matrix M and then injected into the cell. So now we have this long uh, time series. Now if you ask why is this a good model for, this, for the noise, it's, it's for two reasons. First of all, the inner layer of the retina is non-spiking, non so those are graded potentials, so they're nicely approximated by Gaussians. And furthermore, this is, this is uh, an obstruction of the addition of many such common noises arising in, in many photoreceptors uh, and being transmitted through many bipolar cells probably. So the Gaussian approximation is a very good approximation for that. And I will skip here to the results and I will later show you how I actually, uh, how we fit everything. But these are results only for the pairwise model just to show you exactly what goes into the, to the GLM so you get kind of a, an intuition to the GLM. So I have here the full equation of our model. So this is the conditional intensity function and all of the terms that I showed you. And now I'll show you here uh, real spikes from two neurons, a green neuron and a blue neuron, and what are the terms that it's getting. Now everything is in the exponential, so everything is on an on a equal footing, and we can just compare them. So Kx, the stimulus input, goes into the two cells. Then we have a refractory input, which you can see basically acts as a refractory period. Right after each time that we're spiking, there is a negative injection of current that prohibits us from spiking in the next few milliseconds. Then we have the direct coupling input. And then lastly, we have the common input that we've inferred that goes into the system. And apart from the intuition about the GLM, I would like you to note here that the direct coupling input is much, much smaller than the other three contributions into the exponential function, which uh, basically uh, motivated us into neglecting the direct coupling input. And why is that? Is that 
because now if we want to look at larger and larger networks, if we look, for example, at 300 neurons, 300 neural networks, we have now 300 squared LIJs. Each one of them is composed of many uh, basis functions. It becomes a very problematic thing to fit. We need a lot of data to do it or impose some kind of other, either sparsifying it or some kind of other constraints that we don't have a good handle on. So we decided that we can do without. So we went back to our model and we abolished the cross coupling filters and we're left with this kind of much simpler model where each cell is basically an independent entity which means that now we can look at many more mo many more neurons and now from now on I will only tell you about uh, the analysis of, of, of this model where we analyze a set of 279 neurons 104 on ganglion cells 175 off ganglion cells but it's exactly the same setup as we've seen before though now we have a large mixing matrix M and we have many noise sources and we start with it. we have 279 noise source noise sources because uh, it's easier <laughs> right so what do we want to do we want to now we want to maximize the likelihood of observing the spike train given all of the model parameters we do that by marginalizing out all of the common input so we're not interest, interested in the actual common input that goes into the system. We want to marginalize that out and see what is the, what are the model parameters, what are all the filters that don't have to do with the common input that give us the best fit. But this is an intractable uh, integral to solve. And just like Philip just showed us, instead of solving the integral, what we can do is use the Laplace approximation. So we tailor expand our function, our log likelihood, around the maximizing value of Q. Here I'm showing that as Q hat. Now this Q hat is going to be our map estimate. It's a, this is the maximum a posteriori estimate of the common input. And now instead of having to solve an intractable integral, all we need to do is maximize this function. So we now have an optimization problem instead. And now we need to optimize it with respect to theta, all of our model parameters, and the mixing matrix, and the common input Q. Any questions? That's a quiet crowd. All right, so we use direct optimization of F using the Newton method, which I've uh, written down here. And that seems to me to, to be the, the computationally expensive uh, part of the of all of this. This is the only computational part of all of this. So I will break it down. Now the gradients of F require OT. It's very easy to do them. It's not a problem. The problem is that in solving this, this equation, we need to solve this linear set of equation. It's as if we need to invert the Hessian here. This is the Hessian of the, the Hessian is the second uh, matrix of, of second derivatives of our uh, objective function. And inverting a Hessian naively takes an uh, OT cubed operation. It, it grows cubically. Now, because this, we need to find all of the common inputs now. And the common input is a very long time series that go to the extent of the experiment. It's a few million uh, bins. This would have been prohibitively expensive. But we notice two things. One is that we can write the Hessian using the sure decomposition in such a way. Now, the only thing to, to actually take from this is that we need to invert only two matrices, the A matrix, shown here, and the S matrix. Now, the S matrix is easy. It's basically this size. It's just the number of parameters in the model times the number of parameters in the model. It doesn't include the common input. It's just a matrix of uh, tens of parameters by tens of parameters. It's trivial to invert. But the second point is that since the common input is an AR process, I told you we chose it to be an autoregressive process, A has a banded structure. So when you actually take the, the, the Hessian, the second derivatives of our, of, of our uh, function with respect to the common input, you see that it's banded. And inverting a banded uh, matrix is actually linear in its length and not cubic. So now we can solve this pro entire problem in linear time, so now it's tractable and we can actually do it. Let me go back one. Sorry. 
So at the end of this stage, what do we have? We have our theta, which is all of the model input, all, all of the model uh, parameters, and Q, the common input to the model, to each one of the cells. But we still need to find the M, the mixing matrix that I showed you earlier. And I will present to you two different ways that we uh, came up with uh, finding that mixing matrix. Uh, the first one is a closed form solution for M using the moment matching. And I will describe it briefly. Uh, basically, each one of our neurons is a Poisson process over the exponential of all of our uh, bivariates and the, the common input. Now, our common input is taken out of, uh, taken out of a, Gaussian, is a Gaussian process, so it has a certain mu. We don't set this to zero because this can absorb, absorb all the bias terms but it has a certain covariance structure. So all the common inputs, the 279 common inputs that I told you about, have a certain covariance structure that they're uh, sharing. Now, we can write the analytic moments, so mu i, are just the expectations of uh, any function of n j, n i to j. But that's a function of our correlation in Q. So now we have a function, an analytic function, for the moment as a function of, of sigma, the covariance matrix. But we also have all the observed moments. Since we have access to the data, of course, we can just calculate the expected values of all of those moments. And then we can invert this analytic expression and out of that get sigma, our uh, covariance of the Qs. Now, it's important to note here that the covariance of Q sigma is related to this M matrix, the mixing matrix, by M, M transpose. Because all the common, because all the source noises are independent, then N, M, M transpose will be the covariance of Q. Another point that is important to notice is that any unitary transformation of M of M will give us the same sigma. So we're not actually getting the mixing matrix, we're only getting sigma here. But that will be good enough because now whatever, whatever decomposition of sigma we take is good enough for as a mixing matrix. Well, why M is not part of the parameters? It, it's just much easier to solve it like this. Okay. Once, okay. once you... you could have put it there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's not uncon it, it still is. Yes. If you measure it, the, the marginal still is over M. Oh, the marginal is over M as well? Yeah. But, but if you now separate them, then we can see each one of our neurons is an independent entity and we can just parallelize the entire process and then solve this process independently, which is much, much faster. Right, the second uh, method that we came up with and we thought we were really smart, but then David, I think, used exactly the same thing this morning. I think it's this. Uh, we, we call it uh, the method of cross-covariation. And, we, and Carlos Brody, I think, has a similar thing in one of his papers. What do we do? We have many repeats, many repeats of our stimulus. I'm going to designate YIR as the uh, spike train, spiking train of uh, neuron I at repeat R. So here we have the PSTH of neuron I, right? If we take now and subtract the PSTH from the real spike train, we get the variation. So we removed all the signal out of it, and we get the, the variation of each one of the neurons of, on each one of the trials from the real signal. And we can form a covariance matrix between neurons I and neurons J. We take the expectation over R of that, and we get a real covariance matrix. Right? And here I've written it for convenience as CIJ, but we can actually now uh, use uh, k equals i plus j or, or i n plus j and we can write it as the two-dimensional object c now it's just a matrix and then we can use the singular value decomposition on it and what I'm showing you here are the singular values of this c matrix and what's important to note is that one singular value is much larger than all of the others and that tells us that that c this uh, matrix of cross covariations is first space time separable and second is well approximated by taking only the first singular vectors so what I'm showing you here now is the first 
singular vector, the first vector I knew, uh, but I've uh, reshaped it into a matrix form so it's easier to see. And in B, what I'm showing you here are the first two singular vectors in V. So that would be the temporal uh, cross covariations. Okay? So now this matrix, which looks just like the matrix I showed you in the earlier uh, method, is again sigma. It's the covariation, it's the covariance of our common inputs. Okay, so how do we know that, that the model feeding actually works? What I'm showing you here is uh, 72 randomly selected neurons. That's each triplet. And then I'm showing you the cross correlation between that randomly selected neuron and its three nearest neighbors. In black, you can see the data, the real data. And in color, you can see the cross correlation of the simulated spike trains. And you can see that the simulated cross correlations and the real cross correlations agree very, very nicely in basically this entire set. So we know that we've captured the second order correlations in our data set. Now we can go one step further and look at the three-point correlation functions. So here what I'm showing you are pairs. The left is data, and the right in each pair is the simulated. And I'm showing you how does a neuron, a randomly selected neuron, how does it depend on the spiking in different time lags of its two nearest neighbors. And you can see again that these uh, three-point correlation functions are also captured extremely well. So we, we gain some confidence in our fits and we start to believe them. Then what we can do is look at our PSTHs. So, oh, I forgot to say something that is important. Every, everything is cross-validated, first of all. Second, I'm throwing away all of our common inputs. The common input, if you remember, was just a means to, to, to get a better fit of our, of our parameters. It's a time series. We don't want to overfit anything, so we throw it away. Now when we generate new spike trains, I'm showing the stimulus to the, to the model, and I'm generating just a new random process, a new realization of the process that has the same kind of statistics, the same uh, autocovariance and everything, but it's a new realization. The, the same is true. Come again? With a new common input. Yeah, yeah, it's a, com a new common, completely new, just the same autocorrelation. Uh, the same was true for the uh, last two slides that I showed you, but so it is also here for the PSTHs, but now I'm doing it for the repeat trials. And in black, you can see the data as spikes, and in blue, you can see the simulated off cell, and you can see that they're hardly distinguishable. Under them, you can see the PSTHs. In black, again, is data. In blue is the model. And under it, you can see the same thing for the on cell, for an example on cell. We can summarize these results by looking at the correlation between the, the real PSTH and the simulated PSTH. And I'm plotting here on this graph. You can see here the first 104 are the on cells, and then uh, up the 175 off cells. And you can see that especially for the off cells, we're doing extremely well in capturing the entire encoding model. For any kind of stimulus that we present to it, we capture the PSTHs very well. Any you question? Said, you said the on-cell is really high. Yes, yes. Yeah, gr great. So we, we believe that, that the on-cells are not doing as well because, like you said, Frederick found that the on-cells are weakly coupled while the off are completely not and we completely abolished all of our cross-coupling. So it might be that we need to reintroduce the cross-coupling, at least for the on population, in order to gain again this, uh, this difference. And this is one future direction that we'll be looking at. So then the validation is also done on the checkerboard? Yeah. And have you tried other things? No, we never. Uh, because they never present. One thing that I always want to do and never got to it is just to present to it a movie. And, and get spike trends and decode it and, and see it, but because they never actually showed it to the to the retina, then I don't have anything to compare it to. It will be like a geeky thing to do. It will be fun, but not beyond that. Sorry. Yes. Would, would you really expect the cost coverage to improve the estimation of the PSTH? Because maybe the, the, the correlation is just a bit higher. Yeah. 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 It, it would affect everything.
by reintroducing the, the cross coupling, I might put less pressure on our common inputs, for example, and then the, the filters themselves that I will that I will retrieve will be different, or or slightly different. B but I I do believe that there will be a difference. Right. So so now we, we kind of like believe that we have a, a working encoding model. Uh, one slide I added out of nervousness yesterday night. Uh, if we now look at, at the, the stimulus input into the exponential and we just take its norm, so we just look at how much energy is in it, and we, we look at the stimulus and the post spike filters that goes into the, that exponential, and we divide it by the same thing of the common input, you can see that it's basically 2.5. That tells us that the common input is, is in charge of a quarter to a third off the, the input that goes into the cell. So this is an important thing that we cannot just throw away. This has an important role here. Right. So now that we know that our encoding model works, we can look at exactly the opposite problem. W what do we want to do? We can look at what is the stimulus that maximizes the log likelihood of observing the stimulus given the spike train and the model parameters. Now, we can write that using Bayes' rule as the likelihood of our stimulus giving the model parameters, right. because we have these uh, K filters, this, the spatial temporal receptive field, that's how this comes along, and the likelihood of our spiking uh, trains given the stimulus and the model parameters. Now, this term here, of course, again, depends on Q, our common inputs. So we're going to do exactly the same trick. We want to integrate it out. We're not able to actually integrate it out. It's intractable. Laplace approximation. We do exactly the same thing. And what we're left is, is a joint optimization over U, the stimulus, and Q, the common input, of this entire function. And what I'm showing you here is two cells. Um, sorry, one thing I should say here. The decoding is, is computationally expensive. So here I'm looking again at only the pairwise model. We're not able to do this for the entire model. So I'm showing you here one example of pairs of neurons and they're spiking. In black is the filtered stimulus to the neuron, and in red is the decoded stimulus to each one of the neurons. And as a byproduct, we get on a trial-to-trial -trial basis the common input that goes into those two models. So how do you do the cross-motivation for this? Do you train on different types of stimuli, or is it a trial? It's the same type. It's all of it is white noise, basically. Now, there is no cross, there's no validation over this, right? This is just a byproduct, basically. We don't have any other access to this common input. But for this, yeah. You train on half of the data and you train yeah. on other realizations of the white noise. Exactly. Right. Now, uh, a little. Uh, so, back in 2008, when Pillow et al. introduced their model, they, they also showed in that paper, w which is a very good paper, that that by accounting for the synchrony between the cells, by having the, the cross-coupling that accounts for the synchrony, when doing this kind of decoding problem, they gain more or less 20% more information about the stimulus from the spike train than in a model that does not have the cross-coupling, that does not account for the synchrony. So what, what we wanted to see is how well do we do with our common input compared to their old model? So I'm reporting here the, the mean squared error with the common input compared to the mean squared error with the instantaneous cross-coupling. And what you can see is that it's doing just as well, uh, which is already encouraging because, like I said, that was a good result that they're doing 20% better. Um, we're, we're happy about it also because of the two reasons that I told you. We believe that this kind of model relates better to the biology. We, we believe that by having the common inputs and not relying on, on uh, cross-couplings, this uh, resembles more the biology. And because now we can extend this kind of analysis to a whole set of 300 neurons and not just 27 cells. So we have much more like computational power. But it still kind of begs the question of like, why common input? And one hypothesis that we put forth is that maybe a common input model has some advantage maybe in terms of not just the amount of, of, of information that it allows to transmit, but maybe it's more robust to jitter. So what we want to look at is, is the jitter analysis. So again, I have here a pair of spike trains. Both of them go into a, 
decoder model. This one is based on around the CI model, the common input model, and this one is based around the cross-coupling model. And both of them give us some kind of a, of a decoded stimulus. And like I said, until now we don't have any jitter yet here in the system. They look the same. We do just as well. But what happens if now I move some of the spikes by a delta t? So I marked here in red the spikes that I've just moved slightly. And now I again pass it through our decoder. So we will probably not do as well, right, in decoding the stimulus because we have some more noise in the system. But maybe the cross-coupling filter would give us some completely funky uh, looking stimulus that, you know, doesn't make any sense. So the way that I will report this data is the follows come up with a sensitivity number. So that's a measure of how sensitive the model is to the jitter. And what I will look at is the, 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 the square difference, the difference squared of the jitter decoded stimulus from the non-jitter decoded stimulus, both for the common input and for the cross-coupling input. And what I will report is the percent difference between the two. So zero means that the two models are as sensitive to jitter Negative numbers mean that the common input model is less sensitive than the uh, cross-coupling model. Are you training the cross-coupling model with the jitter? No, no, no. Both of them are only being trained with the real data. Th there's, yeah. And now what I'm showing you here is this kind of a percent change in the sensitivity as a function of the synchronization between the cells, between the pairs of the cells. So, of course, when we have zero synchrony between the cells, they're basically decoupled. So both models uh, are reduced back to this kind of decoupled model. We don't need any of this fancy work. But for cells that are, that are correlated between them, which account for this 20% gain in information that they've reported, we see that the, cross, that the um, model with the common input is about 15% from 0 to 15, wherever you want, less sensitive to the jitter. So we, we believe that this model is, if, if I'm an LGN neuron now, and there is, of course, some, some noise in the ganglion cells, is still able to decode the, the scene better than in the other model. And an intuition for that is basically that in the cross-coupling uh, model, the only thing that when we introduced the jitter, the only thing we can blame the jitter on was on a different stimulus. So any kind of jitter here was translated to difference in the stimulus. Well, in this new model, in the common input model, we have both the, the stimulus and the common input. So we can blame the jitter on the common input while still maintain our stimulus intact. Right, so that's another source of, of, of noise, but both of those are the same. Right, so I have two minutes, so I'll tell you a little bit of future work. So this is a slide that I stole for, from uh, E.J. Chichelinsky uh, that is about to appear. Uh, they're doing exactly the same setup now, but with a much, much higher resolution of stimulus. So now instead of just resolving a ganglion cell as a blob, they are actually able to resolve the actual photoreceptors that compose the ganglion cells. So the photoreceptors that are linked to the ganglion cells. So here you see a ganglion cell at a certain position and its connectivity to all, of it, all the photoreceptors that give him the information. So this is one avenue of research is basically, okay, now let's look at this much higher resolution data. It's a very difficult problem because now all of our spatial temporal receptive fields will be much more difficult, but what we hope to gain is that now, like Fred Ricky said, that, that, uh, that the common input, the common noise is probably due to, to shared photoreceptors, it's probably due to, the, to noise in the photoreceptors, now we will be able to basically count the number of shared photoreceptors and correlate the common input between the cells that we see and this kind of number between them. That's one thing. Another thing here in this slide that you can see is that I was only looking at parasol cells, but there are other cell types uh, in the retina that also have been reported to have synchronized firing, which has different temporal dynamics and might be subserved by different architectures. And it will be interesting to do this kind of analysis 
for that kind of population, for different populations of cells, and see what are the differences, and are we able to get any insight. And of course, the third uh, future work direction that we're supposed to do is to just reintroduce the cross-coupling into the own population and see if we can uh, push that up a little bit. So for conclusion, the common input is quite significant and can be accounted for in a tractable model. The network models include, that include common input lead to estimates that better match true connectivity, and common input and stimulus input can be decoded on a single trial basis. And I'd like to thank all of you and Fred Ricky that for supplying us a lot of the data and a lot of people that made these uh, custom-made uh, arrays that were very difficult, and a lot of other people. And all of the supporting agencies, including the Gatsby Foundation, that paid for my part. Thank you. We started with 279 or the same number of neurons as, as uh, dimensions because it's the easiest. A and we always thought that, okay, then we'll start reducing it or then we can take uh, a, a, an SVD off that common input and see maybe it's uh, a lower dimension, like lives in a lower dimension. But we never actually got to do that. And I'm, I'm not sure why. I, I think the intuition is that you have a lot of common input. A, a lot of different sources because it is coming out of the photoreceptors, I think. And yes, it's an aggregated effect of many bipolar cells and many, many photoreceptors, but two ganglion cells need to share basically uh, uh, the receptive field or need to overlap slightly their receptive field in order to have this kind of common input. So there will be a lot. 